Hello and welcome back to the introduction to squirrel programming. Today we're going to be doing array iteration theory and a practical example. This is a continuation from the last video. This video is in two sections, an array recap, array iterations, setting up and understanding scripts, and understanding how to use other scripts modular, and how the map works inside with these examples. Make sure you know all the techniques from below before starting this video. Array recap. An array is a collection of elements of the same type in statically typed languages. Dynamically typed languages implement a list, which is a dynamic array. Once initialized, an array cannot expand its size, while a list can expand even if it's not stated which size it should be. This is the downside of an array. The downside of a list is space. The list would need to be double its capacity, taking up more space. The array solves this issue as it's assigned a fixed size. Each element is assigned a unique number called an index. You can iterate over the array with a for and for each loop. Both loops iterate over an array of elements. For each loop, iterates over a loop where each element is assigned to a variable. Used for read-only purposes, not used to change individual values inside the array. It has easier syntax to iterate over a collection of items. A for loop increments, decrements, iteration variable can vary while the condition is true. Allows more expression for the condition, more flexibility in terms of expressions to use, and can directly change array elements. A for loop contains an internalization, a continuation condition, and an action. Initialization is the local i equals zero. This is creating the value before the loop starts. Then the continuation condition is activated. This has to be a conditional, so it has to be a boolean. And while this boolean is true, the action will activate. Therefore, iteration over each element by either increasing it by one or decreasing it by one. This action will only take place if the condition inside the continuation condition is true. And here's an example of a for each loop, and here's an example of a for loop. One can directly access each element of the array, but one can't, and that is the for each loop, because the for each loop only enumerates over the arrays. So you cannot assign a value using the for each loop, as for each loops are tended to display back information. A for each loop is good for displaying back elements to display. Because of its easy syntax, it makes iterations over the elements simplistic. The downside of a for each loop is that it's read only, and that restricts assigning each element's value. You cannot jump ahead of the loop, so you need to iterate through each individual element. You can jump the elements in the iteration, but you can't jump further away than one element above. Before each loop uses expression conditions to iterate through the array, and you can directly access any element and change its value. But this can cause issues if the expression condition isn't correct. That could be because of using wrong values to iterate the true condition. Readability becomes more complex as you nest the for loops. And this is when you have to use 2D arrays or more. Section 2 is understanding the scripts used in the video. You have to have a good knowledge of a 1D array, a 2D array, and a 3D array. While wow. this video also continues iterating over an array with a for each loop, which is used in the 1D and 2D array, I'm going to be iterating over the 3D array with a for loop. New things that new things are going to be introduced is clone array with scales implemented clone expression, which is a shallow copy of the array. Clone an array with a for loop iteration. We're using code patterns from other NUT files. This is the part of modular programming. Implementing a namespace for the file and why to implement it into the file. To use an other script within a script, you have to specify include script with its name. Preferably, put this at the top of the file. How it works is you tell Squirrel that you want to find the vscript array print in the vscripts folder. It'll look inside the vscripts folder and try to see if it can find it. If it's successful, the script that wants to use those functions can have direct access to it. This does not make a copy, but will allow the file to access what's implemented in the other vscript. But what happens if a vscript folder is in the other folder that you want to access? You just need to put a slash for the folder directly that you want to access it by. The second example shows you what happens if you put it in the vscript folder inside the cool vscript folder. And this is what it looks like if it's in multiple folders. Remember that these folders need to be in the vscript folder or they need to be embedded with the correct folder name or this will cause an issue. 
The good thing about modern programming is the ability to reuse patterns, which is good resource management. The free script print array file contains the logic behind printing and displaying back the array back to the game. Free script array uses these functions twice, and the free script array 3D file contains three references to the print namespace. So already, if I create an alter one, I can just simply reference the free script print array file, and already I will have access without rewriting the whole code again. So this is the good part about modular programming. What is a namespace? A namespace is a unique name given to an object, preferably a class, to separate its functionality to avoid conflicts of other similar functions or methods which contains the same name. It is also used to organize the objects. Most languages implement hierarchical namespace structure with prefixes to separate classes within classes, just like a computer folder. This is the map that contains the logic for the arrays, for example. So we have our player spawns here, and we have a logic script here. This logic script is the free script underscore array dot not file. So that is, so it's this file here, and these here are buttons, which controls the main functions of the array. These are three buttons. Each of them have an output on pressed. It will run the script called toggle button function with a parameter passed into as number one. This is the same throughout each one. So this will toggle on or off. This button here clears the 2D array if you want to reset it. This button here prints out the 2D array. And this button here adds it onto the list. So that's what the 2D array section here does. But the interesting one is over here. This is where you use a 3D array. Each section here is a checkpoint. There is a logic timer here, which is not accurate, but just for demonstration purposes. There is also a logic script over here, which is the free script array underscore 3D file. Each checkpoint's output will always trigger the checkpoint function with a parameter of what checkpoint it is. with the difference of the first one enabling the timer. So, in order to successfully complete this part, you have to go from section 1, checkpoint 2, checkpoint 3, checkpoint 4, and when you go back to checkpoint 1, it adds it to a 2D array. And then you start off again, and you'll do this three times in a row. And then once the third time's done, your total time is calculated with an average time. Now let's see this example in game. So this is the three buttons here. They're all false by default. This is a 1D array, which is a boolean, with max size being three and the max element size being two, because it's the max length, take away one, which is three, take away one, which is two. So two is our max element we're gonna be working with. So I've set the middle one true. Index one is set to true. Well, index zero, and index 2 is set to false. Now we can add this onto the 2D array. That's it added. Now let's print out the current 2D array. So as we can see, row 1 in R2D is false, true, false. Let's now enable this one and add it and display it back. False, true, true, add it in, display it back out. And notice as this is false, true, true, while this is false, true, false. Let's enable this one, true, 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 add it in, and make them all false. Then let's add that in and let's display it back to the screen. Notice now there are four rows and each of these four rows can 
obtains a unique 1D array of the last array before we added it onto the 2D array. Let's now reset the array and let's try and print out. Notice as now we have an error because the 2D array is now empty. Let's add the last one in and display it back. And notice now it's back to rule run and it's false, false, false. And that's how the 2D array works in this example. And this is where the 3D array comes in. This is where the 3D array comes into play. You start in checkpoint 1, checkpoint 2, checkpoint 3, and checkpoint 4. When you go back to checkpoint 1, it calculates your average lap around. It is not accurate, it's just for demonstration purposes. You do this three times, which is a 2D array of three rows with four columns. And then after you go here for the third time, it completes the array. And then that 2D array is added onto the 3D array. I'll show you this example. The first lap, I'll do crouch. Second lap, I will shift. And last lap, I will run. Let's start. Notice as the message will always be one checkpoint ahead. And notice as the first rule contains three laps and those three laps each contain four. So from this we have one set of three which contains a set of four. And as we can tell, the average time is each one is faster than each other. So we know that that's working. So if I do this again, there we go. Notice now as there's row zero and there's row one. The reason why that number is quite big is because I accidentally activated that. So don't need to worry about that. And notice as it's almost continuous when it comes to the average time, which is not too bad. So let's try that again, but this time let's crouch the whole way. There we go. The first one would be slower than the rest because zero. But if this zero wasn't here, all this would be exactly 11 average time per lap. So now this 3D array contains three sets of three and in each of these elements arrays, they contain four. So currently at the moment, this is a three, three, four array where there's three rows, which each contain three columns and those three columns each contain four columns. So now let's go to the logic behind this. The first script you're going to look into is v, v script underscore array. Notice that the first line does the include script and we want to tell Hammer we want to try and look for v script underscore array underscore print. This will come up as an error if you cannot find it. Then we create a global array which is a list and those contains three elements and each of those elements will be false. We are using the array constructor which sets each of these three elements false. Notice as we use the new slot operator to tell Squirrel that this button array is a global variable. Same with this here. But instead, we're going to declare an array constructor, but with zero elements, and there's nothing assigned to this. It's important that R becomes before 2D, because doing this is an error. 
because you cannot have a number in front as a variable. So that is why I done R in front of 2D because that'd be an illegal move. The first function here is to print the 2D array. This invokes the print 2D array inside the print namespace and we're passing in our 2D, which is this variable here. The second function is a toggle button, which holds a parameter called number. I have what I'm gonna do. This is a multi-line comment with a slash, a star, and a star, and a slash. All this here is a comment, and comments are not compiled once the game starts with the script. We declare a local variable, free of those. Then we use a tenary operator. So we're checking that the number here, take away one, because remember we're accessing an array is less than equal to the array max, which should be three, take away one. So that's n, take away one, which would be two. So the first check conditional checks if the number is with n, zero, and two. And if this is true, it will display back here, true. And if it's false, it will display back false into here. The second conditional makes sure that whatever the number, take away one, is above zero because you can't have a negative index in arrays. This would turn true if the number is bigger than zero and returns false if the number is not. Then we put it into an other tenary operator. If both of these conditions are true, then the number take away one goes into index. If both, if one of them are false, then the null gets put into index. Before I start, you should notice that there's an error with the logic between here, but I'll show you after this. So we have a button array, we reference the index, and then we use the not operator to change this into what is not. So if this is true, the opposite of true is false. And if this is false, the opposite of false is true. So using this in front of this, it's basically a toggle. Then we would display back using the print namespace and using the get one day array from vscripts underscore array dot underscore print. The two day array appends it using the append method from the array class and it implements a one day array of what's already inside button array and it stores it inside R2D. The clear 2D array function just simply clears the 2D array completely. One thing we can do is improve the error handling. I'll show you what I mean. So let's test this logic. So we're going to use script underscore execute and the file that we want to execute it with. So now let's clear this. So now what happens is, if I pause this and turn off the fast time, pause that and do script, toggle button one, that's all good. Notice as it says, array is true, false, false. If I toggle this command again, notice as now it says, array is false, false, false. So that's working fine. But if I go for free, it's false, false, true. I go again, it's false, false, false. So now if I do negative one, I have an error. This is because I haven't tested if it goes beyond that index. But what happens if I put a float in there? it still acts as one, so that's an issue. So let's solve this issue. First one being 
negative 1. An error has occurred. The index null does not exist. And it shows us it's happening at line 35. Line 35. So this line here is giving us an issue. So something must be wrong with this. Okay guys, I am back with a fix. So what you can't do with an integer is assign it to null. You can't set value types to null because it's an issue because they can't be null. So that's the issue that's here. So what I've added here is extra condition checking. We first of all check if the index here is an integer. And we also check that these two conditions are true. If so, we successfully toggle the element inside that array to its opposite, and then we display back the array. If not, then we display back an invalid number with the index and what the parameter was. Script underscore execute we skip the array. Make sure there's no errors. And then we do script toggle one. Notice as we have array is true, false, false. Use that again. Notice that's now false, false, false. Let's go below our boundaries, zero. Zero is an invalid number. Parameter, parameter is zero. Let's go beyond our array index. Invalid number four. Parameter is four, makes sense. Let's try 0 0.1, which is a float. Invalid number, doesn't accept floats, expected. And the final thing, negative one, you can't have that in an array. Invalid number. So if you do one, two, and three, all is true. So that's the extra work an extra condition checking you have to do with your procedures. Now we have the 3D array. We include the Fuscript array print file. We declare a global empty array because Hammer doesn't natively support 3D arrays or 2D arrays, only 1D arrays. We have a lap. We use two array constructors. One creates a row of three and within those rows of three, we use an other constructor to create empty ones with four. We have an integer, which is a global variable, because of the new slot operator, and we assign it zero. We have a bool array. This is the checkpoint array. And we have the time array, which is also at zero, and this is what's going to be used with our 3D. We have a clock, which is a global variable, used for logic timer. It is not accurate. So this is not accurate. So we have a function called checkpoint, which puts in a parameter called number. This is the pseudo code. So if you don't understand this code completely, this is the instructions it will take. So we check that the last index that we're working with is true. And then what we do is we check if the number is more than the max length. If so, we reach the fourth checkpoint. But let's ignore this. The more important one is here. This means that we have not reached the fourth checkpoint. So then what we can do is assign the last element to false. And then we can assign the current element, which is number, to true. So if we go to the first checkpoint, the second checkpoint is set to true. The first checkpoint is set to false. If we go to the second checkpoint, the third checkpoint is set to true. And the current one is set to false. And then we assign whatever the clock value into that element. We reset the clock and we display back 
using the print namespace and using the get 1d array function. And if it's the wrong checkpoint, we display Mac it's the wrong checkpoint. And this is where this logic comes into play. When we reach the fourth index, we have to set the current one to false. So we set the fourth checkpoint to false. Then we set the first one back to true. So we can repeat the loop. Then we store it into the fourth element. Then we shallow copy the array clone into the lap array, into the lap count variable. So that'd be zero, one to two. And then we clone whatever is in time r to it. And if lap plus one equals three, that means that we finished. We append the clone lap now. So now we clone this array and we store that append it to r3d and then we use the print namespace again with instead the print 3d array with the r3d parameter so we pass in this 3d array we display it's finished we reset it using that function with another parameter which is a boolean which is true and then we target the logic timer which is called time and we tell it to disable it and then we say that it's cloned successfully and we display back what it is cloned as and we increment it plus one if it's not equal to three we manually then use a default parameter which is set to false with the reset arrays so if we go to that now notice this now I have a default parameter so I can declare it parameterless even though it is assigned false. So all I have to do is assign it true to not be false. So using a default parameter can save you lots of work. So if this is set to false, which is the opposite of true, so this is false, we set the time array to 0, 0, 0. We do not want to clear the time r array because if we cleared that, that means that all four elements are null and it's not an integer. Then we redeclare the array variable to an constructor of three with constructors of four. We set the time r back to four zeros. We set the row count to zero. We reset the clock to zero and we reset the bulwar array to true false false. Then we have a set time function which increments it by one. And if it's an error, we just print no. I can show you on Hammer how that's done. If we go to our logic timer, outputs on timer, 3D script, it's just here, run script code, set time, parameter list, and that's how that works. Now I can get into my favorite part, and in the next tutorial, we will finally learn object oriented programming which is actually quite fun. See you in the next one.